Uh, to refresh your memory, I'm Suzanne Thorpe. I am a uh, Mellon Fellow and lecturer in the music department at Columbia University. And uh, we have a fantastic uh, panel for you today. But before I introduce them, I'd like to welcome my co-moderator uh, for this event. Hello, uh, this is Diana Rodriguez, who is a PhD candidate in the composition department of uh, Columbia University and very active also in the Computer Music Center. Diana, would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a, a little bit of background about you? Um, hello, I'm Diana Rodriguez. Um, I was born in Bogota, Colombia. I make uh, electroacoustic music. Uh, I'm, right now, I work at the CMC and take classes there too. Uh, my music, you can uh, think of it as a post-spectral, ambient, pop culture, Colombian folk, rock and espanol <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I've been collaborating with fantastic ensembles like Tag, Yaron Wire, uh, Lara Cox, and you name it, it's been just great to make music. And yes, I'm here just uh, with Suzanne. I'm very happy to be here. Great. I'm, I'm super excited to have you with us as well. Um, you know, Diana's got, got stakes in this game. So, um, and she, even just the short uh, conversations that we've had um, has already you know, generated new ideas for me. So um, I'm so excited to have you at the table as well. Um, so we, like I said, we have a wonderful panel ahead um, and with uh, Lafray Sai from the Future Sounds, uh, Willie May Future Sounds. Uh, we also have Cristobal Martinez um, from the San Francisco Art Institute and who's also um, a fantastic uh, sound artist and social activist with groups such as Post Commodity and Radio Healer. Uh, he'll be talking about his projects and we have uh, the fabulous King Brit joining us from UCSD, my, um, my alma mater. <laughs> um, yeah, right? Um, who will be talking about Black Tronica. Um, so first I'd like to introduce Lafray. Um, Lafray uh, has been a wonderful uh, addition uh, to my conversations around this uh, in the past year or so, right? Two year and a half, two years. And, you know, actually it started in the early pandemic is when it started. I remember uh, meeting up with you and I was like, I got to work with this woman. She's really fantastic and wonderful. Um, but just some quick background about Lafray. Um, uh, she's an award-winning and internationally acclaimed multi-instrumentalist, educator, composer, and electroacoustic adventurer. Bedrock to her artistry is the roots and the fruits of the blues from spirituals to Afro-diasporic futurist soundscapes that explore time travel, prayer, meditation, and the African-American ecstatic tradition. As a composer, she writes for film, theater, and large and extended jazz and classical orchestras, and her creative range spans immersive and amb ambisonic music, blues, various ethnomusicology traditions, rock, pop, hip hop, and her own brand of subaquatic deconstructed techno soul. Thank you for that one, Lafray. Um, <laughs> to date, she has shared her international creativity in 38 countries. Lafray has is also the executive director um, and director of artistic programming at Willie May Future Sounds, named after Willie May Big Mama Thornton, and uh, is a steam based it's a steam based year round empowerment through music program that includes spiritual activism, Afro diasporic futurism, critical thinking, and leadership, including music technology through the lens of the blues tradition for girls and gender non-conforming youth in New York City. And with la that, Lafray, I'm going to turn the, turn the microphone, as it were, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, what an honor to be here today. Thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this panel. And uh, it's, it's great to see you, Crystal Ball. I look forward to hearing more about your work. And King Britt, I hold you in the highest esteem. So I appreciate you. Um, and I actually have to give a shout out because uh, I, I see a Frank Ski. It's actually Ski, Suzanne. It's okay. Often, oh. <laughs> often, no, it's totally fine. Um, but um, the, probably the coolest octogenarians on the call are my parents. So um, love and thank you to both of you for uh, getting me started on this journey of finding my direction with being of service through music and sound, especially to young people. I, I wanted to, and Suzanne, could you give me maybe a 
seven minute warning or something so that I keep track I can do of, that, yeah, sure. I appreciate that. Okay, so I'm gonna do this screen share thing. Oh, I'm not, um, I haven't been promoted to co-host yet. Uh, Kay, can you uh, promote? Um, yes, that is happening right now. Great. Okay. Thank you. I put together a little little thing. Can you guys see my? All good. All good. All right. Hold up. Let me get this straight here. Um, I'm just gonna let that bar stay up there. I don't know. Let's see. So I am. I am the executive director. Uh, of Willie Mae Rock Camp. It was formerly known Willie Mae Rock Camp for Girls. And Willie Mae Rock Camp is actually the second rock camp that was created in the United States. Now, uh, when you go to the rock camp kind of group meetings, there's like rock camp Zimbabwe. You know, it's, it's a phenomenon that's been all over the world. And it, it started from, uh, the first rock camp was in Portland. And actually, I read about it in a magazine, and I thought, huh, that's interesting. Um, I myself uh, moved to New York as a jazz musician and immediately like hit the ground uh, getting gigs and doing that thing, uh, looking for the, the gig. And um, it, was, it was a challenge to be a volunteer at this rock camp, but I'm so grateful that I did. I saw a sign in a rehearsal studio saying that they were about to try to do a New York rock camp. And I was like, wow. So I showed up and volunteered. And it was an interesting process. And a lot of rock camps came to Willie Mae before they started their own rock camp. And people volunteered at Willie Mae or in Portland. And one of the things that we, uh, in terms of like the recipe for belonging, we uh, had some real intentional conversations about how we were going to engage with the young people, what we should do, what we should avoid, and uh, kind of came up with some things that I call the Willie Mae way. So, uh, and honestly, like as someone that came up with having to practice an instrument, grateful for that, thank you mom and dad, but having to practice and uh, being told that this is right and this is wrong and this is how you play it, um, and then being, uh, I went to, I went to Oberlin and the conservatory there, very like jazz canon. This is the, this is how you do it. Learn your chords, learn, learn, learn the deal. Uh, so rock camp was interesting for me, but I, I took a step back and I watched, uh, young people come to this camp having no facility on the instrument at all an instrument that they chose to play because of a, of a desire. And I watched a band write a song over a single bass note played by a young person who didn't have the facility to even move up and down the neck, just played an open string. And because of that chord not changing, the song had more tension. And um, the the pianist like added a part bling, 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 over the bump bump, bump of the bass. The drummer was like, and then the guitarist had some lessons, so they were able to solo. And um, it was these 15 year old young people, girls who uh, wrote this song, Screw You Loser, I Am Not An Option. And they were serious as a heart attack. And um, watching that come together just changed my whole thing about what it takes to make music and what music making music is really about. I I I then uh, not long after that uh, started getting gigs with major label artists and realized really quickly that it wasn't my it wasn't my groove at all. Uh, and I started working. Uh, I started doing State Department tours. It was a program that was the extension of 
the uh, jazz ambassadors, the original jazz ambassadors being uh, Louis Armstrong, Dave Brubeck, um, Dizzy Gillespie, etc. cetera. Uh, so uh, the jazz was seen as uh, our sonic secret weapon. And we were sent to areas to do this cultural diplomacy work. And it immediately like lit my fire because when I was touring with major label artists, uh, all I ever saw was the green room, the hotel, and the airport, and whatever ground transportation mostly. And then we moved on to the next city. And what I liked about the State Department touring was that we had the opportunity to spend some time and do some workshops. And I love teaching and connecting with people. And it would be like either a week of workshops with a culminating concert or a concert with a week of workshops. And both of those shapes would have different energies that would, I just reveled in it. Um, I ended up getting hired by the State Department to be a, uh, a teaching mentor for everyone that was applying for that program and going out. So they would come to me and they would give their uh, workshop and I would give them feedback because uh, there would be things to consider. And, and it's interesting because so many of the cats who came through, are, you know, y'all might have records by them and they're all like, yeah, I can teach. I teach at such and such school and I teach at such and such school. And they would get up there on that, on that blackboard and, um, or that whiteboard or whatever and basically try to teach every detail that they knew about the subject. And um, it was a very chalk and talk. I started to see these teaching styles um, that I realized from spending so much time out in the field perhaps don't always resonate with, with cross-culturally or with the age range or with the experience range uh, of the people within the workshop. So it was a real learning experience for me and um, I was able to give feedback and it helped crystallize sort of my concepts about workshops and educating and connecting and, and getting information across to people in general. I also had another experience, um, I co-wrote one of the first jazz um, improvisation curriculums for the middle school level. And I had seven years to throw spaghetti at the wall and we gathered data at the end of classes and at the end of this, the 15 week sessions. And we were able to see what stuck and what didn't stick, stick. And what was really interesting to me was that the same thing held true for middle school kids that held true for middle school kids also held true for adults. Most of the workshops at the end, most people generally did not seem to remember more than three salient points. And so this helped crystallize kind of my focus. And uh, I ended up creating my own NGO uh, called Groove Diplomacy based upon the idea that a groove makes you move and movement creates community, unity, and change. And through Groove Diplomacy, I would take a, an assignment uh, either with an embassy or with another NGO uh, on the ground and we would they would throw me a budget I would hire my friends we would put together a thing go over there and rehearse uh, I would write music I would also use conduction um, I come from the lineage of Butch Butch Morris and Greg Tate uh, Butch Morris was a mentor Greg Tate was a friend but I learned a lot from him, and I still learn a lot from him. Um, in fact, um, I think that my, this is a image that somebody drew of one of the last concerts. Uh, I'm conducting the Burnt Sugar Orchestra, and that's Greg Tate in the red hat looking on. He had me um, conduct, so that, that's, a, that's a real big salient point in my pivot points. So fast forward. Willie Mae is in its 17th year, and they approached me and asked me to be ED, or consider being ED, and I was too busy touring, and I said no. They reapproached in 2020, and I kind of was like, well, my answer was no, but then they said, you can do something different. 
And I realized I had been working using electronic music. I never considered myself to be an electronic musician, but I always used electronics in my compositions. Uh, it wasn't really until um, COVID when I started getting invited by these societies to do streams and what have you. Uh, but I always used electronics in building my own sounds in my work at home and uh, doing sound design and composition work. I also realized that dealing with electronics allowed young people to really focus and listen so closely. Also, uh, when dealing with analog gear especially, as you start to turn the knobs, you have to make small movements because if you make a big movement, you may not get back to where you were. And that whole like watching a young person just slowly make that small movement and listening to the harmonic shifts is such a centering thing and such an educational way to teach listening. Um, I, I definitely come from a deep listening uh, from my own experience, uh, I was talking with someone, I think my first immersive sound experience was uh, church. My grandmother was the organist for Mount Pisgah AME Church, shout out to my me mommy. And uh, maybe the next immersive experience I had was my freshman year of high school when I played flute in the marching band and standing around with the brass, everybody facing in a circle playing uh, was, was very like a huge listening thing for me. LaFrey, um, I just want to remind you, you've got about five minutes left. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to, we are named after Big Mama Thornton, and this is Willie Made by the Numbers. This is 2021, and we have gone from three schools to nine schools. Our partners are up, and what we're doing now is we're running our curriculum and we plan to export the curriculum by our third year. Um, so y'all know the challenges because that's why we're here. But our approach uh, basically has to do with space being a place.
there. So for us, space is the place. It's how we cultivate space, it's how we hold space, and it's how we encourage the students to take up space. And we also have a real methodology around how we train our teaching artists. Uh, we don't, we have a genre-free zone. Uh, we don't try to put the children's music in boxes. Uh, we just let them experience the sound. And we often find that the boxes uh, force them into grooving to the sound of their own oppression anyway. Uh, so we, we uh, encourage them to color outside of the lines. Our teaching artists probably listen 75% and speak 25% in the space. And our lessons are short and have deliverables that include uh, reflection, creativity, and encourage improvisation. And uh, our curriculum puts artists, great music artists, visual artists, in the same conversation as uh, musical artists. And we address the whole child. Here's our one of our spaces, and our scientific method is mess around and find out. And that is a singing bowl, 18 inch. Uh, it's a C. It's the grounding tone. And the students have started to say things that they want to create, and then they say, put the bell on it. And then somebody rings the bell and sends the sound out with the intention, connecting sound and intention. Uh, our whole space absolutely uh, reflects uh, the identity of our students and also connects to our curriculum. They learn field recording in the, the vein of Zora Neale Hurston. Uh, we believe representation is inspiration. Our teaching artists and our digital mentors also look like our students. and not across the board, but as much as possible. Uh, we've got um, amazing mentors coming through. We're about to do a Juneteenth Rock and Roll Science Fair coming up with Nona Hendricks as a partner, um, who we're building a pipeline. So connections to not only great musical artists, but academics, so that the students know of other directions that they can go. Um, we've, we have Susie Analog through talking to them about how to, um, how to create and finalize a project conceptually. Uh, we have more mother come through and um, talk about writing poetry and cadence. And um, we create this space in the schools and then we also engender this within our personal space uh, in Brooklyn. So uh, in closing, I'll skip that. Um, I think that for us, our take on belonging is it seems like most institutions probably bend over backwards to try to say you are welcome here. But um, our take is uh, this is yours. This is, this is yours. And that's how we operate with our students. And um, I'm grateful to have this opportunity to share. The time flew by, but hopefully... If y'all are interested, check us out, williemayrockcamp.org. And uh, we appreciate your support. And Suzanne, thank you so much again for having me. And I love you, Mom and Dad. Thank you so much. Diana, I'm going to turn it over to you. It is my pleasure to um, introduce Cristobal Martinez, uh, he is a PhD, is mestizo uh, of the Genizaro Pueblo Manito and Chicans people of Northern New Mexico. He's a publishing scholar and uh, interdisciplinary uh, artist, composer in the, in the electronic experimental music duet Red Culebra, a co-founding member of the indigenous hacker ensemble Radio Healer. Martinez is the chair of the an associate professor professor and art technology of the San Francisco Art Institute. In 2015, he earned a doctorate in rhetoric 
linguistics and composition from Arizona State University while focusing his research on emerging media technologies within the context of indigenous self-determination and sovereignty. Welcome, so happy to have you here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Diana. Thank you, Suzanne, for bringing me to the table. Thank you, Lafrey, that was so beautiful, so inspiring. It's an honor to be here with you and King today. Hello, King. Um, so today I'm gonna um, I'm gonna focus on uh, the work of post commodity and um, post commodity sound practice and music practice, and I'm I'm gonna sort of gloss through some examples of our work just to give you a sense of how uh, we as an indigenous collective use uh, music and sound to build a discourse. And so uh, let me get going here, sharing my screen. Okay, share sound, optimize for video, get all that set up. Okay. Oh gosh, I think I'm having some kind of technical, okay, hopefully not. I hope this works. You're seeing it. Uh, okay, you're seeing it. Hopefully you'll hear it. Um, but do you hear me okay? Like, yep, all my... good. Okay, all right. So um, I'm just going to provide you with a little bit of context. Uh, Post Commodity is an interdisciplinary art collective comprised of myself, um, Ms. Diesel, and Kate Altwiss Cherokee. Uh, Post Commodities art functions as a shared indigenous lens and voice to engage the assaultive manifestations of the global market and its supporting institutions, public perceptions, beliefs, and individual actions that comprise the ever expanding multinational, multiracial, and multi ethnic colonizing force that is defining the 21st century through ever increasing velocities and complex forms of violence. Post-commodity works to forge new metaphors capable of rationalizing our shared experiences within this increasingly challenging contemporary environment, promote a constructive discourse that challenges the social, political, and economic processes that are destabilizing communities and geographies, and connect indigenous narratives of cultural self-determination with the broader public sphere. So um, today I would like to start out by presenting to you this work titled From Smoke and Tangled Waters, We Carry Fire Home. This was um, installed in 2018 and uh, it's a sculptural graphic score for a solo jazz performance. And I'll just show you a couple of images here. This is a um, indigenous sand painting. Um, it's 3,200 square feet and it's comprised of coal, glass and steel and was commissioned for the um, 57th edition of Carnegie International. And so uh, from Smoke and Tangle Waters, we carry fire home is um, was created to honor the legacy of African-American self-determination in Pittsburgh in the context of um, uh, steel production and by connecting the material of local industry with indigenous sand painting traditions and the cultural traditions of black liberation and revolution within the imagined colonial space, both commodity invokes the transformative ruptures of the Underground Railroad the Great Migration, the rise of organized Black labor, and the birth of the Pittsburgh jazz sound for radical reflection, healing, and regeneration. And from earth to material to sacrifice to liberation and revolutionary cultural expression, the African-American community of Pittsburgh will always be self-determined and venerated. And over the course of the 57th Carnegie International, from Smoke and Tangled Waters, we carried fire home was performed at 1 p.m. every Thursday through Sunday. And Post Commodity would like to sincerely thank the Afro-American Music Institute and the jazz and creative music communities of Pittsburgh for sharing the spirit with the world 
for six months. A couple other detailed shots of the sand painting and from above. Okay, hopefully this audio works. Are we good? Can be a lot of things. You know, it can be about materiality. Sometimes it needs to be about something more politically poignant. Sometimes it needs to bring the noise and confusion to an oversimplified situation. When we think about Pittsburgh, I think America in general, the first thing that comes to mind is still something special the public doesn't readily think about is that there was a historically vibrant jazz community in Pittsburgh that played a special role in the emergence of jazz in America. The sand painting that we're presenting on the ground functions as a score that can be read by musicians what they are asked to do is find a position on the score and begin in any key assigned to that position. With that position, they will reinterpret through the density of materials how dense their music will be. Other than that, all of the musicians will have the agency to determine where the music goes. That the score is designed to be freely interpreted reinforces our idea that music can convey complex histories of all of us engaging in the world together and all of this complexity getting stirred up along the way. We all need to learn from how people successfully negotiate challenges and overcome them. In African-American history, jazz is a form of improvised liberation for self-determination. It also speaks to the larger narrative of labor and this geography. This region suffered for industry, but music's like prayers. It carries our spirit up like fire, like smoke. It gives us strength and endurance and self-determination to bring fire back home. Okay, um, this next work that I'm going to share with you is titled The Point of Final Collapse, and this was installed in 2019. What you're looking at here is what's called the Millennium Tower uh, in San Francisco, California. This is one of the tallest residential high-rises in the United States. It's also some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Uh, what is uh, significant about this tower in terms of, well, one, it symbolizes um, the getaway economy of the, of the California Bay Area, but it, it does more than that. It's, it's not only a place that is, is a, represents um, the exuberance of our irrational economic systems, but it's sinking and tilting. And right now it's leaning, I, it's right around over 16 inches um, and, and has uh, sunk uh, more than a foot. And uh, it's becoming more and more unstable. Now this piece, the point of final collapse is a sound installation and broadly conceptual work that focuses on the sinking millennium tower, responding to a scenario of capitalism contributing to the development of new conceptual frameworks of risk and accountability. And as a building falls, its value rises. Post-commodity will engage the perspectives of a broad public by providing a call to prayer for relief from the economic stresses and dangers of a city in the throes of radical social, cultural, architectural, and economic transformation. This installation uses computational algorithms that parse data representing the movement of the tower. And this movement data is then mapped to healing ASMR audio and soothing binaural beats, transforming the sonification of the sinking and tilting of the Millennium Tower into therapeutic sounds designed to encourage relaxation by extending the, powers of, the power of the city's scenic beauty. Long range acoustic devices or sonic weapons installed in the tower at San Francisco Art Institute's historic Chestnut Street campus, will certainly broadcast this indeterminate generative multi-channel sound composition to North Beach and downtown San Francisco for a four minute duration each day at 5.01 PM. 
The point of final collapse renders legible the logics of capitalism, which encode fear, desire, and the inability for the greater public to rationalize and control systems of power. I'm going to play a little bit of the sonification for you. This next work is called Let Us Pray for the Water Between Us, installed in 2020 at the Minneapolis Institute of Art in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Let Us Pray for the Water Between Us is a site-specific installation responding to the forced displacement of indigenous communities and the complexity of human relationships bound by shared sources of water that are increasingly difficult to protect and preserve from waste and contamination. For this imposing work, Post Commodity transforms a 2,200 gallon chemical storage tank, primarily used for industrial farming, into a self playing percussive and resonant instrument. The collective modifies a venerated, venerated place designed to secure cultural objects representing the Western Judeo Christian scientific worldview by removing the resident Greek sculpture Doriferous and additional artifacts. By altering the purpose of the rotunda, Post Commodity has prepared a new contemporary context better suited to its indigenous voice. The shifted rotunda presents a symbolic appending of the white European foundations of the museum and seeks to forcibly dismantle the institutional structures that have excluded or objectified indigenous peoples and their cultures. Let us pray for the water between us acknowledges and honors through living, breathing sound, the role of indigenous tribes as important stewards of water, air, and land in Minnesota and throughout the Americas. It's a prayer for greater respect, accountability, and transparency among state and federal governments and corporations to tribal governments and communities around the appropriate management of our shared natural resources. And I'm gonna play a, a recording of the drum. Uh, uh, it probably won't sound all that uh, exciting to you unless you're wearing headphones, but here goes. So what's happening here is that 20 milliseconds is added per unit of time. So you start out with the uh, with the beat um, that is um, that is dropped at every four seconds, and that eventually expands out to eight seconds, and then it contracts back down. So it's a palindrome, and it's meant to it's it's in the rotunda, so it's meant it's meant to convey. A, a kind of breathing or a kind of heart, the sort of transformation of the heart of the museum or the, or the respiratory mechanism of the museum so that we could begin to embody a, a consciousness around um, 
around local the preservation of, of water. You fresh water is, you know, one in Minnesota has one of the largest um, reserves of fresh water in the world, yet um, a statistically significant percentage of the water is yet already polluted. Okay, I'm gonna move on to one more piece. This work is called Going to Water and was re recently installed um, at the, in the fall of 2021. And this is a multi-channel video and sound installation commissioned by Rainy Modern Museum in uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And Going to Water depicts uh, the Owens Valley uh, located east of the Sierra Mountains in California. Indigenous peoples have long conveyed, converged in the area to trade and socialize. And the nearby Paiute tribes of Bishop and Lone Pine uh, call the valley place of flowing water. In the early 1900s, uh, the city of Los Angeles constructed an aqueduct to divert water from the valley, carrying it over 300 kilometers south to support the city's growing population. This caused Owens Lake to go dry by 1926, devastating the valley's ecosystem. This was one of the largest riparian habitats in North America. The empty lake bed creates large dust storms that carry toxic cancer-causing particles for miles. Communities in the valley have been heavily impacted by adverse health effects caused by the lake bed dust, the loss of viable farmland and ongoing displacement. As environmental policy and action, the government agency currently operates 22 cameras throughout the valley to monitor the environmental conditions, essentially to monitor the dust that's going into the air. Um, because what has to happen now for um, uh, mitigation, cancer mitigation is the, the the dry lake bed has to be irrigated. It has to be watered in order to keep dust from entering into the atmosphere. And for going to water, Coast Commodity gathered footage from the online archive of these recordings and projected onto three large screens with an expansive and haunting soundtrack. The work creates a tension between the scenic beauty of the valley and the horror of ecological disaster. And, and I, I would say that the, the, the sound aspect to this installation, the music aspect is about grieving and grieving for the land.
Uh, this particular uh, installation, what you're looking at is you're looking at uh, a day of um, camera video surveillance that captured um, uh, very large quantities of dust um, blowing through Owens Valley. Um, I want to thank you all so much. Thank, thank you for, for, for listening to me. And again, I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Cristobal, that the work was fantastic um, and the depth, I think, uh, is uh, so evident and clear. Um, and thank you for sharing that. Um, okay, so we're going to, there's so much fantastic work at this table, frankly, I kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's almost overwhelming. Um, so we're going to move on to our uh, next presenter, um, which is King Britt. Um, welcome, King. Uh, I'm going to try to work through your also fantastic bio here um, as a way to introduce you to our to our audience who don't know you. Um, King is a Pew Fellowship recipient and is a 30 plus year producer, composer, and performer in electronic music. His position as assistant teaching professor in Computer Music University of California carries unique perspective, bringing a non-linear approach and knowledge to the department, I would second that, um, by uh, focusing on various modern forms of electronic music pedagogy <clears throat> while continuing to be an active force in the music industry. As a composer and producer, his practice has led to collaborations with the likes of De La Soul, Alarmable Sound Orchestra, Saul Williams, director Michael Mann, and many others, as well as being called for remixes from an eclectic list of giants, including Meredith Monk, Solange, to Calvin Harris, most recently collaborating with MacArthur fellow Tyson Sori, sorry, Tyson, sorry, Tyson Sori, uh, for an upcoming album project. In his role as performer, he has traveled globally, uh, playing thousands of venues and festivals, including Afropunk, uh, Bergen in Berlin, Moogfest, uh, Le Guess Who Festival, I uh, haven't caught that one, and The Kitchen in, in, in good old New York City. Um, his curatorial work has been seen in many collaborations with the likes of MoMA PS1, Philadelphia Museum of Art, uh, Philadelphia, and most recently at Carnegie Hall, uh, Blacktronica, Afrofuturism, and Electronic Music uh, is new uh, to UCSD lecture course, uh, which we're going to hear more about today. And um, you know what, um, your, your bio just keeps going on and on. Yeah. And in the interest of time and hearing from you rather than me, sure. I'm going to uh, let you have the floor. <laughs> yeah, so hopefully um, I'm coming through clearly. I just want to thank you for inviting me to this. You know, I'm new to, the, new to this. And um, thank Columbia University. Uh, shout out to Cristobal and, um, of course, Lafray. Much respect. I mean, wow. You know, that was so inspiring. I want to, I definitely want to talk to you after. But anyway, very inspiring. And thank you to your parents for creating you, you know. And so let's just jump into it. Uh, hopefully I can share the screen. I know I'm under time restraint, so I will try to go as fast as possible. So I thought the best way to start this would be to share a uh, video that one of my students from the course actually uh, created um, for me uh, and for UCSD. And um, this is an intro to what Blacktronica is about. So here we go. And it's a, it's a minute and a half, so it's you know, no big deal. Hi. My name is King James Britt, and I'm assistant teaching professor here at UCSD and creator of this course, Electronica, Afrofuturism and Electronic Music. So this course honors the people of color who pioneered groundbreaking genres within electronic music. We'll research not only the process and technologies, but also the sonic responses to socio-political events that affected the underrepresented communities, giving birth to jazz fusion, Chicago House, Detroit Techno, Drum and Bass, the LA Beat scene, and the rest of the global sound history. 
From Sun Ra to Flying Lotus to More Mother and beyond, we shine a light on these musicians that are pivotal in the modern advancement of electronic music. I have also had many of the pioneers as guests in previous quarters, which you'll have archival access to during this quarter. So come, join me on this journey. I'll see you soon. And so um, I was first, you know, taken aback that my student was so uh, driven to <clears throat> create this video for us, um, but she was very inspired by the course. And so we'll talk about the course really quickly. So Blacktronica, a necessary change in electronic music uh, pedagogy. So the word, let's talk about the word, the origin of the word Blacktronica, okay? So the word Blacktronica, the first time I heard it, is an umbrella term used for many innovative genres of electronic music that are rooted in and created from black and indigenous culture. The term was coined by Charlie Dark of the UK trip hop group Attica Blues in 1999 for a series of high art and music events presented at the ICA in London and various venues in London as well. So as a practitioner and producer in electronic music for 35 plus years, I've been you know, immersed in many different genres um, um, and contributed to many different genres. And one of them is going uh, to England all the time to hang out with Charlie Dark and to be a part of uh, Blacktronica when it was in its inception and then it went on for about three years. Uh, this is Charlie Dark himself uh, with the incredible Oberheim uh, machine. And then these are some of the flyers from the original Blacktronica party. So if you notice, Blacktronica has a C. And um, so I'll get to why it changed to K. But these are the original flyers. And this is kind of the a lot of the guests and the aesthetic of, of what was going on at Blacktronica. So this was, remember, 1999 to around 2001. And so let's talk about the pedagogy. I say pedagogy, but I don't know which, which one is the right way. Anyway, so um, as you heard, these words just mirror what uh, was said in the intro video. So I don't need to kind of read it again, but I'll leave it up while I talk about it. So when I got to UCSD, like I said, I was 35 plus years in as a producer uh, and practitioner, which I still am, and traveling, but working for myself. And then I got the opportunity to work here at UCSD. Uh, big shout out to my good friend, Alyssa, who's, I think she's in the house actually, um, who gave me the tip to uh, apply to UCSD. So thank you for that. Uh, changed, the, changed the world. And so when I got here, I noticed that there was a, this absence around the conversation um, with the, uh, around the advancement of electronic music, but there, they weren't, nobody was talking about black people's contribution to the advancement of electronic music. I mean, disco, house, uh, drum and bass, dub, um, all of these genres come out of, um, you know, black communities. A lot of those communities are underrepresented and marginalized. And the importance of that conversation and the creation of those um, those genres, I hate, to, I, now that LaFrey said, you're genreless, I don't even want to say the word anymore because that was really beautiful. But, you know, all of these genres that we created and then in the media kind of get whitewashed, you know, and the commodification of these um, genres, said genres that came out of our communities. So I, there's this disconnection, right? And so I was like, you know, UCSD is amazing. They've been extremely supportive of anything that I come up with. And so I approached the, you know, the chair, I was like, yo, can I start this course? I want to call it Blacktronica. So I had thought about the name. I remember from the parties, I asked Charlie, can I use the name? He said, like, sure, no problem. But I changed it to K instead of a C just for aesthetic purposes. And then the chair was like, yeah, let's do it. You know, please, like, we want you to do it. And I thought about it also. I was like, I'm kind of the perfect person to do it and this isn't in an egotistical way but it's in a way that i was there with for hero when they started doing cutting up beats and in creating drum and bass or 
I met Goldie way back in the day. You know, I, I've been working with a lot of these artists. And so I was like, wow, a lot of these artists are my friends. I can just call them and they can, you know, kind of come in class and that sort of thing. And so I kind of put together the whole, the whole, um, uh, the course quickly. And UCSD, no problem. Like they helped me put it all together, get it official. And now we have Blacktronica, Afrofuturism uh, in electronic music. We started out right when the pandemic started. And so I had to pivot the way I created the course so that it would fit Zoom. And luckily, because I'm on social media all the time, maybe too much, I was able to kind of create a course that works perfectly for Zoom. And so it went from 30 students back then to now 300 students. And then we're predicting five to 600 students in the fall because now it's across all UCs. And so the beautiful thing about it, it works so well on Zoom and there's a certain aesthetic that comes with it. So, uh, you know, I ask all the students to create their, their visual world uh, and universe and then they can see it all. So it just brings, psychologically brings all the students into a community, right? But they still have their individuality through each, right? And so we're looking at it through an Afrofuturism lens. And so this is a perfect kind of visual aesthetic for Zoom for them to come into. And so also coming from club culture, which most of the genres that we are conversing about and researching is all coming from the clubs, right? And so with club culture, we don't just talk about music, but we talk about the whole community, which includes the visual aspect. And so we do flyers for every artist that comes as a, as a guest. All these artists are virtual so far. I, I continue to have the class virtually because it works and translates extremely well um, through it. And we also have, as an extension, I started a club night because I still DJ. And we have the club night on campus uh, right here at the loft, which uh, I'm sure Suzanne remembers the loft. And um, so all the students come and they get to hear the music that we study in the environment that it's supposed to be heard. And it's a safe space. There's no judgment. And um, they, they really, you know, a lot of the students aren't even 21. So this will be their first club experience and what better way to do it than to have it coincide with a class, right? And so I'm just trying to get the club as a classroom. So hopefully that club will be a classroom in about a year, and then I can teach it in the club. Like that's my dream, right? But what better way? I think every student will want to be in the club to, to learn about it, right? Then we got approached by Google Arts and Culture. We did an exhibition with Google Arts and Culture. Um, talking about a lot of the, you know, paying homage to a lot of the heroes, but also a lot of the new innovators of electronic music. And um, like LaFrey had, you know, Susie Analog is in there, more mothers in there, uh, Christina Wheeler as far as new, and then Carl Craig, Hank Shockley, and so on and so on. And then we've been getting a lot of press in DJ magazines, but also in academic magazines as well, like The Wire. And uh, so the, the course is starting to bridge the gap between, you know, academia and kind of pop culture slash club life that's happening. So uh, my first guest ever in the class was my mentor, one of my mentors and hero that I met at the BRC back in the mid 80s or late 80s, uh, Mr. Greg Tate, which LaFrey uh, talked about earlier. Rest in peace, Greg. And uh, of course, Yatasha Womack. And the reason I had both of them, because I always start the course off, uh, you know, with the, the groundwork on Afrofuturism and just to set up how the course, you know, looking through the lens of Afrofuturism. And so it meant a lot to me that Greg Tate, who is my mentor uh, in this clip, you know, is, is giving praise to the importance of Blacktronica and now, once he said that, I've been on a mission to create one of the best courses that I can bring to the table. 
uh, on the same oh. day. So, oh, that's you know, fresh. Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm glad you. I'm glad you recorded these classes, man. These are gonna. These are gonna be some. I mean, no, no, for real, man. No, for real. These are gonna be like some classic documents of the state of the art. Thank you. You know, the state of black sonic art. Man. Well, I'm, I'm. I'm super honored that both of you joined us today. Man, I'm honored to to be part of this lineup you got coming to. Man. <laughs> yeah. yeah, same here. This is epic. <laughs> Thank you so much, y'all. Yeah. This, right. this is great. But um, you can stick around and listen to this mix, but it'll also be online at okay. 3 o'clock today. Uh, the mix, not the recording, not the video recording. That's only for the students. Uh, okay. For now. Okay. All right. But um, I appreciate everything, and uh, I'm sure the class all appreciates you. Um, and well, man, thanks for making the link and uh, brightening up the lockdown up here in Harlem. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's like, it's like, yeah, every day you got to figure out, okay, how am I going to make this day more interesting? <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what am I going to read? What am I going to create? Like, what am I going right. to listen to? What am I going to watch? Yeah. Right. It's definitely yeah. a reset. It's heavy. Yeah. You know, but great, great time for creation, reflection, introspection, mm -hmm. development. Yes. Research and design, all of that. Oh, yeah. there you go. So everything, everything Greg said, I took to heart. That was the first class ever, and I just pushed forward. Also, I want to send shout out to Paul Bradshaw, who started Straight No Chaser magazine, one of my favorite magazines and one of the first magazines to really put emphasis on um, electronic music coming out of uh, black culture you know, and really paying homage and putting us on the covers, not just in the covers, but on the covers, right? And another shout out to DeForest Brown Jr. and Ting for their movement, Make Techno Black Again, and also Ash Lauren for Underground and Black, who um, both have really brought to the forefront, especially in the media, uh, the importance of paying homage to all the black innovators in electronic music. So I'm gonna show you a few clips. All of these clips are like a minute, so they'll be quick. Uh, these are some of the guests that we've had in class. The beautiful thing about the class, because it's on Zoom, the class gets to interact directly with these artists and these innovators and these pioneers. So Hank Shockley was one of our first guests. Of course, the the you know, the founder of the Bomb Squad, along with his brother Keith and um, and uh, Chuck D, uh, better known as Public Enemy. And so we had Hank, and this is just Hank talking about Public Enemy sound. But it's these little interviews that just change the game as far as, like, young students who are just getting into this type of music and hearing firsthand from A little these bit guys. of an edge. For example, you know, what after I got the 1200, which was after the, the 900 came to the SP12, SP, I knew about the SP12, but I waited for the SP1200. And, and once the, S, once the SP1200 came out, there's little things in, in the SP1200 that you can do. Like, like if you don't, if you, if we, first of all, we never used the, 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 uh, the multi, multiple outs. Okay. Oh, okay. You, you all right. Because out, everything. Yeah. Yeah, because 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 the, the problem about the multiple outs was it, it the sound was not tight. It didn't have the compression that you would get coming out of the main outs. I keep telling the, the, So so the main outs, the main outs now where, where you so in order for us to do that, that means that we had to like we had to like pro you know put something in and then play it down and then play it down to the track and then do it again and again. So every track had to be done tediously one at a time as opposed to being able to take the uh, the outputs and just run them out, all right. Yeah. That's a that that would do, then we could just save ourselves time. But instead of doing it that way, it gave us the grit and the power that we was looking for to for those records that to the records to have a little bit more punch. And then the other thing that we found out was that is that when I played it, the 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 twelve hundred didn't I didn't have the uh, the 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 quarter inch jack all the way. Okay. And by not having it in all the way, it took the sound and shaved off all the top end. Ah. So all you got is the muffled bottom end of the sample. Oh, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
All right. So now doing that, now after hearing hearing that, that's what we did with Black Steel in the Hour of Chaos. There you go. We now realize that we can filter because because back in the, if you go, you, you remember back, an EQ doesn't really get rid of, doesn't kill not, the top end. It all. just attenuates it. And if you if you know anything about hip hop history, that is the key. These are the golden keys. These are the golden keys that all of these innovators are dropping on my students. And because I have a close relationship with all of them, it's like a fireside chat. There's no, you don't feel intimidated. It's really cool. Uh, next up, we have Kame Ayewa, which of course we all know is more mother. Uh, one of the most powerful voices um, in music today. Um, these are her different uh, groups and projects. And um, so to save time, not to go in fanboy over more mother, but I've, you know, I've had, uh, we've been friends for a long time, but still she just keeps amazing me like every week, <laughs> you know, with the new project, but we had her in class. This is her talking about temporality. Been um, lately thinking about uh, um, different temporalities, especially when making music. Oh, okay. And um, just this idea of like, so yesterday I made three tracks and they were so amazing. I was like on a high, you know. Then I wake up and I listen to them and I'm like, what are these tracks? What was I doing? What's you know, just trying to figure out. Because, you know, when we talk about time, it's definitely in this uh, circular motion, you know, cyclical motion. It's always coming around and you're always able to tap into different, if you open yourself up to, different yeah. temporalities and different messages. So I'm really having, a, you know, a moment with this kind of thing, like, well, well where was I last night? You know, <laughs> what was I in touch with? What time, you know, what temporal elements was I, you know? Right. And so we'll keep it going. Theo Parrish, one of the most important DJ producers of all time, coming from born and raised in Chicago, but then migrating and moving to Detroit, right? So you got the, he's kind of the, the, the link between the two worlds, especially at the time when the inception, the beginnings of early house and also the beginnings of early techno and how they, kind of cross pollinate so anyway we had him in and this is theo talking about putting in the work you got to put the work yeah, in. Know it. but then you you realize that the people in detroit are, are like this they know that the road is so hard in front of you that if you're going to climb it mm. by the mere fact that you surviving that's almost your your pass like it's it's that difficult <laughs> it's just right because you it's it's so many psychological press, pressures because you not only have to live up to your uniqueness, but now you have to live up to the halo that Detroit is already there, whether you like it or not. Mm. And so you you have to do maintenance on that halo, whether no matter what your ego is saying, no matter what your creativity is 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 at its best or not, or is it are you plateauing? Whatever's going on with you creatively, you still have to live up to what's come before you. You gotta live up to your catalog. Right. We're not, and you can't, you're not given a chance to relax. Falling off, what's falling off? You better push forward and hope you fall off that way. You better fall off the edge. You can't, you can't fall in the safety. You fall in the safety creatively. Then you have nothing more to say to Detroit. And if you have nothing more to say to Detroit, you have nothing more to say from Detroit. Mm -hmm. Because there's a lot of that happening where people are taking what Detroit is and taking a halo and running with the ball. We've seen that before. Put the work in, yeah. whether you're playing, whether you DJing, whether you're, be, you, whether you're creating stuff, fuck your marketing. Marcus, you have to have something to market. Right. Finish 300 songs. Mm -hmm. Fini finish 300 of them. When did you I'm trying to finish 300. <laughs> when did you move to Detroit? Oh my God, that might have been 95. Okay. And I moved to Detroit. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. It's 95. So I paid my dues, you know, oh, you need yeah. at least 15 years. Yeah. You need 15 years in here. And they was not messing with the dude from Chicago. <laughs> and so, you know, just to keep it moving, these are short clips. I think I have what, five minutes left. Diana. I I actually, um, it should be wrapping up. 
Oh, okay. So, all right. Uh, let me just play Fly Low then. Flying Lotus, uh, for those of you who don't know, one of the most important artists from the LA beat scene. The LA beat scene itself is one of the most powerful genres or movements that change the way we listen to music and they left their sonic imprint on pop culture. And uh, out of that scene, Flying Lotus, of course, is the most popular and he just uh, opened our Afrofuturism Festival at, at Carnegie Hall. Um, but, you know, his aunt, he comes from a long lineage, and his aunt is Alice Coltrane. His uncle is John Coltrane, on and on and on. But this is Flylo talking about uh, film scoring. But the reason I'm showing you all these clips, this one be, will be the last clip, it just shows you it's, you know, we're getting firsthand keys from the actual artists and it shows you the importance of our conversation, the conversation of people of color within computer music, within electronic music production, within it all. And so I'm so honored to be in the position to have this conversation and to spark more around the world. So hopefully many of you that are in this room will come hang in the class or do the research or spread the word i don't want it um and i didn't want to do the like you know i was just like i can't do that no way there ain't no way that's coming out of my computer like at all you know um and i just started to start i started to think about all the things that it wasn't first was like it's not gonna be this it's not gonna be that and i was just like what haven't i seen in anime yet like what would really make this special um and i really hadn't heard anybody do like the straight synthesizer-y kind of thing and yeah i, I just kind of try to make a sonic palette i think that was the first step for the soundtrack was just kind of saying okay i'm only using x amount of synthesizers these ones only this is it you know and then yes. everything else is like so i'll stop it there even though i had masters of work but um yes so uh thank you for your time thank you for having me uh here and um yes blacktronica afrofuturism and electronic music we're here we're not going anywhere all right, Thanks. fantastic. So many uh, wonderful uh, examples. Um, Diana, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much for all your work and all your talks. Just, uh, I'm still, like, I'm about to graduate in two years, so I have so much hope, uh, which sometimes you can be, get really super jaded when you feel suffocated with uh, an environment that doesn't uh, <clears throat> mirror you. So I want to thank you for giving me so much hope. And I'm wondering about um, what advice would you give uh, to instructors or young people teaching technology to create supportive environments? And the, the question is open for everybody, of course. I don't know who wants to go. <laughs> Um, I'll just go, um, I, you know, I always want to be, I always want to relate to the student. I'm always a student, right? I'm new to academia, right? So I've only been in it around two and a half years, but what I've done in that two and a half years, uh, has been pretty powerful. And I think it's because we as instructors are always the students. I'm learning from them, you know, so as far as my, I teach electronic music production as well so you know i don't say oh this is the right way to do it i always say how do you do it and how this is how i do it that's how you do it let's kind of meet you know in the middle and these are all just tools to kind of get to a place um where you know someone can create a track or a song to release or if it's 
you know, with Black Tronica and and how I set up the the course, you know, it it because it's on Zoom, I wanted it to be as immersive as possible. So lots of beautiful visuals which coincide with what the the material is anyway because it's coming out of club culture or coming out of Afrofuturism. So visually it's stunning anyway. And so it's really about careful curation and how to present the best possible pro, uh, best possible class to the students, you know. But it's really just staying open and staying staying true to your vision, but also um, staying the student. I'd like to speak to that as well. Thank you, King. Um, this is we we don't enforce Eurocentric standards of correctness with regard to rhythm, pitch. Uh, timbre and technique. Uh, the students will get that everywhere else. And uh, so that's really our approach. Also using the tech as tools for expression and liberation, sonic mm. liberation. Mm. Speak on it. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't know if Cristobal would like also to answer that question. Yeah, I. So I chair art and technology at the San Francisco Art Institute. So I'm always thinking about strategies for, for teaching uh, technology and or how to use tools or hack tools or modify tools or adapt tools so that you can communicate your ideas or your experiences. And you know, I find that um, a lot of times I mean, one of the things I always wondered was like why, like where I'm from in, in Northern New Mexico, we, we have a really rich low riding culture, low rider tradition, you know, Española, New Mexico. And, and I, I always wondered why we, we, we had so much trouble, you know, in math or, you know, in schools where, you know, we're not performing very, very high. And then we go out and, to the garage and we do these really um, innovative, uh, a lot of very innovative engineering. You know, there's statics, there's there's all kinds of physics and and um, and technology, applied technology, applied sciences going on in our garages. And so I, I realized that, you know, in order to learn a tool, it, it's got to be positioned in a culturally responsive way, in a culturally um, um, uh, sensible way. And so I always try to work with my students to, to try to understand like what, what is it that, that they want to, what are their interests? What is it that you want to say? And then try to use that as the context for, for teaching. Um, so I always think it's gotta, it's gotta be tied to what, look, if we want to go somewhere, we're, we'll figure out how to get there. And that's that's when it's in our interest to learn something, yeah. like, And so I just, I try to create these kinds of environments, and I love I love what King is up to and Lafrey is up to because it it's it's really about creating a learning community in an open environment and in, in an informal environment in a place where you know we can learn from each other and and yeah I completely agree with 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 everything and, and, and really resonate with it and wish I could be in, in your programs and in your classes. <laughs> but, you know, just to, to add to this, like your work and, and you're kind of like this, this quiet disruptor, right? You have to be a disruptor <laughs> if you're going to break what, what is break the mold of what is, what is it in what we're in now, right? Like you have to decolonize what has happened and yeah. what you're doing, your work is so important. Like when, like that first piece that you showed uh, with the musicians, with the graphic score on the oh, yeah. ground, but what it represented underground railroad, all of it, like that, that's, that's why I call you the quiet disruptor. You know, it's like you're getting in these spaces and you're completely 
re let's call it remixing those spaces yeah, right totally totally you know it's so yeah yeah, that's yeah we you know we've learned so much from afrofuturism as a collective yes. and uh you know we we really credit and and, and really really uh, salute uh afrofuturism and 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 from that it's inspired our indigenous futurism and yes. you know, we're hackers we want to hack spaces we want to hack material we want to hack technologies but but not not to not necessarily to innovate on these technologies but to use them pragmatically to tell the stories that are subjugated or to build new public memory or and you know, in Pittsburgh, we we got to work with uh, with the Afro um, Music Institute in um, in Pittsburgh, which is an institute that is embedded in a black neighborhood in Pittsburgh, and that required three years of relationship building. Yes. You know, a place where like Indians and black people are going to come together, and you're going to try to like have conversations about why do we need to be working together? And why are we not seeing exhibitions with black artists and native artists? Mm. You know, why, why haven't we seen that exhibition in this country? Mm. Um, and then, you know, we start talking and we're kind of like, well, who are you or who are you? And then we start realizing, well, you know what? Um, a lot of the, a lot of the um, musicians, the black musicians at the Afro Music Institute they're you know they're Cherokee they have they have native ancestors and so we started talking about migration and in using that as a very it is a quiet way it's a kind of subversive very quiet way to to bring one to build new public memory about histories that are not being that are not being venerated in the larger public sphere of Pittsburgh but to also begin to use the narrative collaboratively, cross-culturally, to speak to immigration mm -hmm. to the United States. It is. And so, yeah, it's been, I, I just feel like, um, thank you for, for acknowledging the, the, the work that we're up to. And oh, yeah. I really appreciate that, King. Thank you. I, I want to do a tour. We, we should all just go to every yeah. place that, you know what I mean? Let's get a grant. Let's make it happen. It'd be awesome. Oh, oh, thank you so much. We have a question on the chat that I invite you to. Uh, we need to wrap up by 315. Uh, I'm going to read it and feel free to uh, to answer real quick. And also in the chat, you might type and get to know the other people there. So Lenny said, when discussing in music and artists with students, how do you divide what to introduce and deconstruct between what's historically important and what you're like into right now with limited class time? Um, I'll, I'll just say really fast, um, because I deal with uh, middle school and high school students, I like to find out what the artists were doing when they were in middle school or high school and not come with any details that you can find on Wikipedia. Go ahead, King. <laughs> that's awesome um i mine is a little bit it's a little has to be a little bit more confined right or a little bit more uh structured just because it's um at ucsd right so i try to i not try i do it through a through a lineage right through i start with i start with the godfather sun ra and then go from Sun Ra to, you know, to more jazz fusion. So I hit on Herbie and Miles, but then I talk about Betty Davis and how important Betty was to introducing Miles to electronics, but then how the funk came out of that. And then from the funk, it goes into, you know, the, it goes into hip hop and the lower East side, but then how the break beat goes into drum and bass. So there's a certain lineage that I actually purposely and intentionally show how all of this leads up to today. And then like you were saying, you talk about artists today, like who are you listening to now? It's like, oh, okay, Solange. Oh, okay, well, she took Sun Ra on tour with her, you know, six shows and six shows in Australia. So 
showing how the generations can come together because of sampling, because of, you know, field recording or taking recordings from the past and bringing them into a different context through uh, making electronic music. So that's that's how I do it historically, uh, but also keeping it modern. And sorry, I know you we're pressed for time. Go ahead. Mr. Oh, thank you. I, I've been trying to take a, a different approach um, to, to teaching. Um, I teach, uh, I've been teaching data sonification and uh, algorithmic uh, generative um, computer music. And what, one of the things that happens a lot with, with art students, and we're, we're talking about sound in a contemporary art context. This is what I'm talking about here is a lot of students, um, uh, when they make um, their sound or, or their music, they're thinking a lot about process. And they're also thinking a lot about their identities. And they're always trying to form their identities. Even maybe sometimes we call them post-commodity build proxy identities through the creation of mm -hmm. art. And, um, and sometimes these things can, can be a bit self-obsessed. And what I want to do as a professor is I want people to see that um, you're, you're, you've already um, inherited a primary discourse. You've already inherited a, a, an identity uh, based on how you were socialized, you know, growing up as a kid. And, and what I'm interested in, in as a professor is, well, how do you see the world through that lens? And so um, data sonification has been an amazing tool for doing that, where um, you look at, a, there's so much data now, right? Everything is data. So you, you, know, you, can look at, you can look at a data set and you can come up with a strategy for creating a, 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 sound, a sound work, but it's already all baked in. The discourse is already all baked in to using that data as, mm. as as um, art material. And that sort of helps students start to cross over and to think conceptually and to think politically and to think, um, uh, to be able to see ideas that are outside of their own bodies mm -hmm. or a sense of their own bodies. And, and in that case, I, I don't teach history at all. I, you know, I, I just try to, and I'm not saying history History is very important. It's just, this is an approach I'm taking right now to try to get students to engage with issues and to go public with ideas. And so just keeping it like a genre free environment as well, you know, like just keeping things really, really open. And like you, you can, it, you can make noise, you can make sound, you, you, these things can have rhythm, they, they can have harmony or they can't, or, they, or maybe they don't. And maybe they sound broken in ways that you might think broken sounds in relationship to how you've been disciplined to understand music by the music industry. Mm. And so, and sometimes it's successful, sometimes it's difficult because, you know, students want examples. And so, but well, anyway. can I add to that? I know you got one minute, right? One minute. Yeah, yeah, we so, can squeeze it. Squeeze so it the, in a minute. The whole idea of, um, yes, so we show the history, but one of the questions that we ask, especially towards the end of the quarter is now that you have seen, and we also talk heavily on the sociopolitical context of where the music's coming from. So now that you have that knowledge and looking through the lens of Afrofuturism, how will you take that and how will it inform your, your life forward, right? That's like our final question. And some of the answers are just unbelievable. Like one girl was like, you know, I've become a better, I can become a better ally to people of color through learning about these uh, sociopolitical situations that this music came from. Now when I'm dancing at say Coachella, I have a different context of where this music is coming from. And I can tell my friends that. And I was like, oh, wow, this is crazy. Or with music production, just like you said, I definitely try to keep that as genre-less as possible because I'm like, create the next, what's the next sound? Uh -huh. like, what's the next sound? 
we uh-huh. have all this like okay what's yeah. the new thing what's the new thing all right yeah it's awesome awesome thank you thank you so much for being here you have no idea how everything bright is like i have so much hope and i'm gonna turn it over to suzanne and thank you again thank you okay so um wow i you know i couldn't have asked for a richer conversation um and like i said the the depth of the work of from each of you uh really resonates with me and um i know resonates with the group um the thoughtfulness the care that goes into the sensibility of belonging that you are trying to um uh, engender in the environments that you're in is uh shining through with this and um having you together as a constellation on this panel um really speaks to the richness of the field in a way that nothing else could so thank you Wow. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So we're going to uh, move on. We're going to take a five minute break so we can jump over. I'm going to be joined by my colleague, Bonnie Jones, uh, for a, eh, let's say, about almost a 25 minute discourse here on collaboration. Um, and uh, we may even play some music for you because what's a music? symposium without a little bit of music being played so um, stay tuned and then following that we have uh, our final panel uh, a fantastic panel on access and accessibility um, Crystal Ball was talking about cultural relevance uh, Hannah Kai will be talking about that and maker spaces will be talking about the use of craft um, with Abby Aristi and improvisation and embodiment with um, Lauren Hayes. So stay tuned and we'll be right back. Thank you.